the sitting been adjourned. Humber Flood Risk Management Strategy, Mr David Davis. Thank you, Sir Roger. It would be a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today. Um, uh, may I start by saying that although I've been fortunate enough to obtain this debate, the interests of the members in the chamber are at least uh, as great as mine. So I'm going to be as brief as I can within 15 minutes subject to adjournments uh, in this important issue. Now, on the 5th of December last year, the news around the world was, of, uh, was dominated by the death of Nelson Mandela. Uh, the death of the greatest statesman of modern history rightly uh, dominated all news coverage as his achievements and legacy were celebrated in every channel. But the, an unfortunate side effect of that was to almost totally eclipse one of the most serious tidal flooding events to hit the United Kingdom for more than half a century. Because the tidal surge that hit the east coast of England that night was devastating. The flood water overtopped over 40 kilometers of flood defenses. We were inches away from the hull tidal barrier being uh, defeated. Had this happened, a significant part of the city uh, would have been flooded. And thousands upon thousands of homes would have been rendered uninhabitable, causing misery for tens of thousands of people. Now, in the event, even without that, 11, over 1,100 properties in the area were flooded, uh, still a miserable consequence for the uh, families and businesses involved. Now, this was a devastating event with the highest water levels uh, ever recorded in the Humber, and we were fortunate that no one was seriously hurt or killed. When in 1953 there was a similar but lesser uh, tidal surge, over 300 people in the east of England died. Now, for the people most closely affected, this flood has been a living nightmare. Warnings were not made in time. In some places, alarms only sounded after the flood water already inundated people's homes. Uh, and across the Humber, most warnings were received only an, hour <coughs> only an hour before the waters rose. So those affected had no time to prepare and were forced to abandon their homes and dearest possessions to the elements. They then faced a living hell of temporary accommodation, not knowing when they'd move back into their own homes. In East Riding alone, <coughs> 200 homes and nearly 50 business properties were flooded. 15 miles of roads were submerged, which led to communities in my constituency being completely cut off. Blacked off, Yoke Fleet, Salt Marsh, Fax Fleet became virtual islands, with residents, unsurprisingly, feeling abandoned and isolated. Now, people in these remote villages Either, uh, either evacuated whilst there was time or forced to abandon the ground floors of their own houses. They gathered what they could upstairs, powerless to stop the torrent of flood water and debris from entering. And uh, for much of the time in complete darkness because of course the power went too. Some of these people are pensioners who moved to the area for a quiet and happy retirement, only to see everything they worked for uh, destroyed. One respondent to the local council survey had been informed, uh, and I quote, Blacktop never floods, close quote, due to the defences there. In this case, the defences just weren't good enough. And, of course, what was a perfectly adequate defence 25 years ago uh, is not necessarily an adequate one today. In 2012, I asked the then Minister, uh, <coughs> the Honourable Member for Newbury, how many homes in my constituency were at risk of flooding and he replied that from 2008 to 2012, the number of properties at risk had increased by 1,000. Uh, this illustrates that with sea levels rising, if defences are not improved, uh, that figure is certain to grow. To my right honourable friend as well. Of course, we'll give way to the member for each I'm grateful for my, to my right honourable friend, and he rightly paints uh, the picture of devastation that occurred in December last year. But does he recognise that if the timing had been a couple of hours different and the wind direction had been different, this devastating event could have been catastrophic with major loss of human life. Mr Davis. Well, I think my honourable friend has read the next page of my speech. <laughs> as, as happens so often these things. Um, the, uh, my, my honourable friend is absolutely right. I mean, there were a number of coincidences. It seems odd to describe the events we had in December as fortunate. But he's right. Had the tidal surge coincided with the astronomical tide, he's right, two hours, uh, it would have been a much bigger event. Had there been uh, the uh, sort of levels of, <coughs> of rainfall that we saw in 2007, 
then the Aire, the Calder, the, uh, the Ouse, the Derwent, the Trent would all have been fuller, and the <coughs> they all feed the Humber, and the Humber itself <coughs> would therefore have started from a higher level, and again, I suspect the Hull tidal defences would have been overtopped uh, and defeated. Uh, and if, of course, if that had happened, we would have seen the sort of picture we saw in the Somerset levels later of the, <coughs> the land flooded for weeks and weeks, if not months, thereafter. So he is absolutely right. <coughs> Had we not been fortunate uh, with the other events than the tidal surge, we would have faced a much bigger catastrophe. It could have turned, as he says, the events of uh, the 5th of December last year uh, into one including uh, 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 fatal incidents. Uh, it would certainly have been at least as bad as what we saw in the Somerset levels, but with the difference that we would have three international ports and a city of 256,000 people in the middle of it. Now, the danger, therefore, is very real. We've had serious flooding, as all the members present know. We've had serious flooding in the region uh, twice in less than a decade, in 2007 and 2013, with other serious uh, localised flooding in 2011. The Humber represents the second highest flood risk in the country, behind only the Thames estuary. And the National Risk Register considers tidal flood, this is what we faced, uh, to be second in terms of severity only to an influenza pandemic. So that's the scale of the threat facing the region. Now, the economic case for action as a result is clear, given the strategic importance of the region to the rest of the country. The local authorities, who have, I should say now, worked incredibly well together uh, uh, over this issue uh, and completely ignored party or regional or uh, geographic differences to, to come to the conclusion of this. They have identified £32 billion pounds of potential damage using the Treasury guidelines uh, uh, for calculating these things. That's straightforward damage, lost productivity, increased insurance costs, and, of course, deterred investment as well. And the economic value uh, at risk includes a number of industries of significant strategic importance. Uh, for example, the Humber is vital to the UK power industry. Uh, the pressure that we put on the UK power network by a major flood event of the kind predicted in the next 50 years would be colossal. 28% of the UK's oil refining capacity is situated in the Humber floodplain. And the loss of such capacity could not be made up uh, by shifting demand to other plants. One of the, and it's an important point that, because that underpins one of the criteria the Treasury used with respect to assessing these things. Very often it's assumed if industry is at risk, it can go somewhere else. That's not true here. Uh, oil and gas terminals in the region process 30% of the country's gas demand. More than 30% of the UK's coal and an increasing amount of biomass uh, fuel lands at Humber ports and is transferred to... Uh, power stations such as Drax, Eggborough uh, and Ferrybridge on road and rail routes that are also at risk from flood. The chemicals industry in the region is enormous in its own right, uh, amounting to uh, over £6 billion. And ultimately, there are over 20,000 businesses in the Humber at risk from flooding. Uh, and the area as a whole contributes some £15 billion to the, to the nation's economy. Now, all this makes the Humber a national strategic asset. And because sea levels are rising, the next flood risk to that asset is not just some distant probability. It's not something that just might happen. In the next 50 years, if we do not enhance our defences, a costly and probably fatal catastrophe will happen. Now, given the region's vulnerability and the number of people at threat, it's past time for action to be taken to uh, deal with this flood risk. By comparison, uh, London, which is the highest risk uh, uh, area in the country, uh, at the heart of the, <coughs> the Thames floodplain, is protected from events on a one in a thousand year basis. One in a thousand year. Now, achieve, to achieve that, the, the uh, London, the Thames flood barrier <coughs> was built between 1974 and 1982. It cost about 534 million pounds, another 100 million pounds of, uh, of investment uh, around it to make it work. In today's money, it's hard to assess accurately, but it's something over three billion pounds, uh, the value of that, that expenditure. Uh, uh, what we're talking about today is a lot of money, 
we're talking about uh, for, the, for the Humber, 888 million pounds, but it's still significantly less than a third, maybe less than a quarter of the actual spend on the, on the Thames barrier. And I don't think anybody today disputes the Thames barrier was an absolute necessity and an act of serious foresight by the, by the government of that day. So with these figures in mind, the people of East Riding, North Lincolnshire and Hull will rightly ask why if the government does not take action to improve the region's defences. Now once it's understood that the Humber represents a national strategic asset, it becomes clear that any system of flood defences for the Humber must address all risk across the entire estuary. On both banks of the Humber, the floodplain is very flat. Uh, some of it's even reclaimed land. I mean, Vermoyden's first actions in, the, uh, uh, in, in Britain uh, using the, what were then very innovative Dutch techniques were, in my honourable friend, the member for Gould's constituency in, in Hatfield Chase, uh, which was drained by Vermoyden. Uh, uh, now, for this reason, for the flatness of the, of, of, of the land and the low-lying levels of the land, uh, it is impossible to separate out any part of the uh, of the defences from another. You can't ring fence the major population centres of Hull or Grimsby or Scunthorpe. It's got to be dealt with as an entity. Um, and in many ways, uh, as Vermoyden sort of demonstrates, uh, our part of uh, England is as close to Holland as you're likely to get uh, in these terms. And the Dutch do not take flood defences, um, uh, do not do flood defences by halves, and neither should we. Uh, the lessons we learned from Vermoyden some centuries ago, perhaps we should reapply now. Uh, to that end, the Environment Agency prepared the Humber Flood Risk Management Strategy in 2008 with the aim of providing the level of defences in the Humber, of improving, sorry, the level of defences in the Humber, most of which dated back to the 1950s after that, that previous flood surge. Now, the surge of last winter has demonstrated that those preparations were, were inadequate and has given the uh, agency new information that's informing a comprehensive update to the strategy. And the aim is to bring the standard defences up to such a standard that they survive not a one in a thousand year event, as London has, but a one in a 200 year event, or at least that's the colloquialism for it. What it really means is a half percent per annum event, a uh, half percent probability percent uh, per annum. Now, it's an ambitious scheme and it will require cooperation across local and national uh, government, across party lines and across the north and south banks of the Humber. Much of that consensus has already been achieved. I say again that the, the, uh, the actions of the agencies, the actions of local government, uh, the actions of the LEP, the actions of the members of parliament have all been completely without uh, attention to narrow self-interest self and with real, real serious um, uh, concern about the overall interest. So, in the next 50 years, it's highly likely you'll see a tidal surge uh, event similar in magnitude, but worse in consequence to the one we experienced last winter. Factoring in the, in the possibility of even less favorable conditions and rising sea levels, it's clear that the impact of the next major flood event could be devastating. There could be a serious threat to life and over 32 million pounds of economic impact. Now, this is not a doomsday event with an outside chance of happening. This is likely to happen at some point in the next half century. We were lucky to escape that outcome last year. If we do not act by implementing the Humber flood risk strategy, then there is a serious risk of such a catastrophe being repeated. Governments of all colours, Tory, Labour, coalition, whatever, find it difficult to make more, take more than a five-year view for obvious democratic reasons. When it comes to flood defences, it's necessary to take at least a 50-year view, if not a multi-century view. And we need to start on a program which will actually take at least 10 years to complete. Yes, the numbers are enormous, and they run into billions of pounds, but the cost of doing nothing in the long run is far greater. December the 5th was a timely warning from, a God-given warning, you might say, of the consequences of inaction. We do well to pay attention to it. Um, I shan't be shocked if the minister hasn't turned up with 900 million pounds in his back pocket for us today. Uh, we'd be disappointed but not shocked. Uh, but I think what we have to say is here we have uh, a conjunction of several things. A major real risk which we know is going to get worse. A demonstration of the, uh, historic demonstration of the real harm 
uh, of that risk if it's ever realized. Uh, a clear strategic asset within that risk, both in terms of industry, economy, uh, links to the outside world, but most importantly of all, the hundreds of thousands of people uh, who are within that risk. And it is vital, because it will take so long uh, to carry out these uh, improvements and enhance our defenses, it is vital that the government takes a strategic view of this, uh, both in terms of uh, direction and in terms of money. Alan Johnson. Thank you. Mr. Gall, it's a pleasure to serve under your distinguished chairmanship and uh, a pleasure to follow the Right Honourable Member for Holton Price and Howden. Um, floods do not recognise constituency boundaries. We come together today, members of Parliament from across Hull, across the East Riding, North Lincolnshire, North East Lincolnshire, because we are united with the local authorities, with the local enterprise partnership and with the environment agency in our diagnosis of the problem and our analysis of the solution. The floods on 5th of December uh, 2013 were not unfamiliar to Hull. We were hit by devastating rainfall, as was the whole of the uh, East Riding as well, in June of 2007. In 2007, the problem came from the, from the sky and not the sea. All the flood defences held, no rivers overflowed. A month's rainfall fell in a couple of days. And the effect of that was on 20,000 properties, 8,600, uh, sorry, 8,600 properties, 20,000 people, 1,300 businesses. What unites the two? There's various figures thrown about as to whether this is a one in a hundred or a one in a two hundred or a one in a thousand. Let's take a conservative view. What unites these two events is in 2007 we were told it was a one in a hundred and in 2013 we were told conservatively a one in a hundred. So in Hull we've had two one in a hundred events in seven years. Uh, that leads the population as well as their political representatives to question the whole basis on whether we have sufficient flood defences. Um, one man died, incidentally, in 2007 in my constituency in Hazel, trapped in a drain while he was trying to clear, uh, trying to cl clear the blockage. So there was a personal tragedy that didn't happen, thankfully, in 2013. Now, the, uh, the term above ordnance datum is something new to me and I hope I've pronounced it correctly but the one thing we found out in December 2013 is the defense at Albert Dock uh, was for a 5.04 above ordnance datum and they were actually hit by a 5.8 uh, meter above uh, 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 above ordnance datum so the first issue and one of which I will welcome reassurance from the minister on is that they need to get the Albert Dock defence higher. I don't think that's an issue between any of us, and it's due to be an absolute priority by the end of this year, but it would be good to have the Minister's assurance of that because that's the most important issue in my constituency. Because what happened on December the 5th, 2013, uh, and the Right Honourable Member for Halton Price and Howden is absolutely right, the Environment Agency say that they got it wrong in terms of scale and timing. But it was amazing to see what happened. If you look at Porter Street in my constituency, which is in the business area, the industrial area of the city, from completely dry sheet, uh, streets to absolute deluge, uh, took four minutes. It was frightening, the severity of the flood. And it hit businesses as diverse as Smith & Nephew, a big global international company who incidentally have other places they can base their manufacturing sites, including in China, if they believe that this is going to become an issue that affects mm. their business on a more regular basis. Uh, they were affected, the Indian restaurant in the Hesel Road was affected and never reopened. It affected all those businesses across the centre of town. The important point, I think, honourable, right honourable member for Holton Price and Howden emphasised this, and 
I need to emphasize it as well. You know, it was a, a warning. Thankfully, as the member for Beverly pointed out, if the wind direction had been different, if it had come two hours later at high tide, it would have been a devastating event because that was the highest water level ever seen in Hull, higher than 1953. And the point here, when you come to the National Risk Register, which the government publishes every year, is that the last time, the only time, there has been a national emergency declared in this country, the only time since the war, was that water surge in 1953. And on December the 5th, it was a bigger surge. The 2013 National Risk Register, and these are updated, of course, every year, but the latest one says, it talks about the it makes this the second biggest risk after a pandemic. I'll come to that in a second, is coastal flooding. But it talks about 1953, talks about it being the first, uh, the only time a national emergency has been declared anywhere in the UK. And then says a less serious storm, storm surge of this nature happened in November 2007 without causing damage on the scale of 1953 emergency. We now need to update that. A much bigger surge occurred on December the 5th 2013 and thankfully didn't cause the death and devastation that was caused in 1953 but it was a close run thing now mr gale i was the secretary of state for health when a pandemic hit in 2009 it's not a comfortable place to be because the number one risk on the risk register is an horrendous thought for government people being confined to their homes children being affected in schools. We thought H1N1 was going to be that kind of pandemic. As things turned out, it wasn't. And now we look at that event as a kind of dry run. We know things about Tamiflu we didn't know before. We know things about other issues there. My message to government is you have to take the tidal surge of December the 5th, uh, 2013, in a similar way. That was a dry run as to what could happen if we don't deal with this issue effectively. And if we are going to deal with the issue uh, effectively, as the Right Honourable Member says, we do need to look at the whole of the area. It is very diverse. Hull now, in terms of the investment by Siemens and the, invest and the investment coming in uh, from various quarters and City of Culture in 2017, there's it is, incidentally, the biggest urban area in Yorkshire. It is the biggest city in Yorkshire if you just take the urban area, 311,000 people. But as I'm sure my, uh, as the Honourable Member for Brigham Gould will point out, we have places like the Isle of Axome. And the Isle of Axome has 20,000 people living in 21,000 hectares of, it's one of the most underpopulated areas. But in a sense, it's like having something that could affect uh, the Somerset levels and Bristol at the same time. That's what we're talking about here in terms of the scale of the threat. The, um, the theme of the document we're preparing to put to government is headed, flood defences cost money, no flood defences cost more. And I hope today, together with the meeting we're due to have with the Prime Minister next week, just records the fact that the scale of this problem has been shown to be far greater than the defences allow. And I'm pleased to see my honourable friend from the opposition front bench here because this is not just a government issue. This is long term affecting any party that's likely to be in government. And in a sense, we've got all three represented here and has to be considered on that basis. My, the right, right Honourable Member for Holton Price and Howden said 888 million. Of course, that's 88 million pounds a year over 10 years. He rightly said Hull is closer to Rotterdam than it is to London. It may well have been a suburb of Rotterdam a couple of million years ago, but <laughs> so, so we look to the kind of defences that we see across in, in Holland and we believe that we are nowhere near that kind of scale. But we're not throwing in 
you know, requests for billions of pounds. 88 million pounds a year to bring us up to a one in 200 defence. Given the circumstances, given the National Risk Register, given what happened on December the 5th, 2013, must surely be a prudent amount of money for any responsible government to spend. It's always a pleasure to be taking part in a debate under your chairmanship and I congratulate my right honourable friend, the member for uh, Howden and Halton Price for securing this debate. A debate which features a subject which touches all of us here in the chamber today to different extents. Um, I don't intend to uh, repeat the arguments he adduced to the uh, chamber. I thought he made an excellent speech and made the case very well. But I would like to reiterate a number of points also included in the area at risk are 30,280 uh, hectares of agricultural land and the UK's largest stormwater pumping station. These are also at risk uh, from flooding in the Humber and East Yorkshire area uh, and these uh, problems need to be addressed. One of my biggest concerns uh, about the present situation uh, Sir Roger is the flood defense grant and aid system which determines who receives help. It largely favors urban areas and this is because the system dictates that the highest risk ratings are in residential properties and this means that rural areas have little weighting meaning they have less chance of securing funding. Well this could have a serious negative effect on food production in this country and the sustainability of agro-businesses. With a significant proportion of the UK's high-grade agricultural land in low-lying areas like East Yorkshire and also Lincolnshire, there is likely to be a danger to the UK's food security and independence unless something is done. Furthermore, smaller residential settlements in rural areas find it very difficult to attract flood defence grant and aid uh, funding uh, because of this formula. This means that if flood risk cannot be addressed or mitigated, there's a danger that not only rural communities remain at risk, they may also become less viable over the longer term. Because East Yorkshire is comparatively remote, there are significant codependencies between the rural areas there and the east riding urban areas in terms of workforce and businesses and I believe this should be taken into account in any adjustment of the formula which the government uh, carry out. Um, one of my constituents just a few days ago contacted me and said we have a climate change levy in this country when assessing what to do with the money raised by this levy Surely there cannot be anything more important in expenditure, term, expenditure terms than flood prevention. So amongst other measures, he asked, why is the climate change levy revenue not being ring-fenced for flood defences? Perhaps the minister could give us his thoughts on that. Um, I hope the minister will agree to look again at the formula and to agree that we not only need a properly funded flood defence system across the country, but we need an integrated approach to flood risk management, which the current level of expenditure and the current formula do not deliver. The Right Honourable Gentleman, the member for Hull West and Hessel, mentioned the devastation across the whole eastern part of the country in 1953. Indeed, there was widespread flooding and devastation then. And in that disaster, a fireman, Andy Devine, who was called upon to help, said afterwards, where we had to pump out, there was the sea on one side and water on the other side. We might just as well have tried to pump the sea dry. A hopeless situation like that must never be allowed to happen again. So I say to the minister, being invaded by flood water from whatever source is just as devastating to a thatched cottage as it is to a terraced house. I hope the minister now will deliver some effective action which will help East Yorkshire be able to face future flood risks with more confidence. Martin Vickers. Thank you, uh, Roger. It's uh, a 
pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and I too join in the congratulations to my right honourable friend for securing this debate which uh, is vital to uh, all of us here and the, and, uh, the whole of uh, the Humberside region. Um, it seems to have been forgotten and in, with, as my right honourable, honourable friend pointed out it was certainly forgotten by the national media at the time that the tidal surge in December uh, was greater than that in 1953 but has also been said, thankfully, it was not as disastrous in terms of loss of life. Clearly, investment in flood defences has been effective, but we came within a whisker uh, due to uh, the weather conditions of it being a major catastrophe. And clearly, more needs to be done. The recent surge uh, contributed a great deal of damage to the Immingham Grimsby Port Complex, which is the largest in the UK, with about a quarter of all rail freight moved starting or ending in Immingham. Much of this freight, coal for the power stations, oil and other essential products, is of vital strategic importance. To be precise, the port handles around 55 million tonnes per annum and approaching 20 million tonnes uh, of oil, 10 million tonnes of coal. The country's uh, strategic supply of road salt is stored in Immingham. Uh, we're in danger, I think, of repeating all the same uh, statistics because we've all got this excellent document that was produced by our local uh, authorities which lists the seriousness of what could have been. Uh, the port director, uh, John Fitzgerald, said we would have been talking of major power cuts and food rationing and I invite the minister to contemplate what would be the consequences if these actions had not been taken. The cost to the national economy would have been meant immense and he was referring to the fact that the port was up and running again in just two days. But a third, fourth, fifth day could have been extremely serious. The impact on essential infrastructure and the supplies that pass through the port uh, could have uh, uh, resulted in major, uh, uh, major impact on the national as well as the local economy. The port was left without electricity and extensive areas were fr uh, flooded. The Environment Secretary visited Immingham on the afternoon of Saturday uh, the 7th of December and with him we heard firsthand from ABP and the Environment Agency staff about the incidents of flooding, not just in Immingham and Grimsby but in the villages of Barrow Haven and in the Goxhill and New Holland areas. We heard from the Dockmaster for Immingham and Grimsby and it is clear that he made exactly the right decision in opening the Grimsby lock gates at exactly the right moment, which prevented a large area of Grimsby and the north end of Cleethorpes, where thousands of terraced houses are situated, from being overcome. The Humber Flood Risk Management Strategy identifies up to 400,000 are at risk from flooding, and just short of 200,000 of them live in the 20% most deprived areas uh, in the UK, according to the government's own statistics. It's also important to point out, as my right honourable friend uh, uh, has, that agriculture is a significant industry and over half a million hectares of productive land in the Humber estuary, 97% of which is high-grade high land. At this point, I can reiterate the view I expressed in my adjournment debate in January and a view repeated by many others that the experience uh, uh, of the farming community is invaluable in matters of flooding, this, the work they do on local drainage boards and the like. And though a forum may exist for them, uh, th there is a, a feeling within the agricultural community that their expertise <coughs> is not actually used to the best advantage. And I would urge him to uh, do all he can to bring that collective knowledge uh, into the best possible use. It is not just existing industrial uh, facilities that need protection. The estuary has been described by ministers as one of enormous uh, potential, particularly in the renewable sector. Government has supported this. We've had the investment uh, uh, from Siemens. The uh, Pan Humber Enterprise Zone was created. The Humber Bridge tolls were reduced. And only yesterday uh, in Parliament, a special committee uh, began considering the final stages of the proposed development on the South Bank by ABLE UK, which could bring a further 4,000 jobs to the area. Subsequent to the uh, <coughs> visit by my uh, right honourable friend, the Environment Secretary, uh, 
the DEFRA minister, my honourable friend from Camborne and Redruth, and also the uh, Prime Minister's uh, flood envoy for the regional, uh, the uh, honourable member for Scarborough and Whitby have visited the area. Uh, and so the, we, the government have certainly got plenty of information uh, available from and the expertise available within the local authority and the environment agency. What is clear is that the whole estuary needs greater protection. If we are to provide greater protection, as we must, the environment agency must be allowed to consider both how best to improve the protection given to strategically important facilities such as the port alongside residential prop uh, properties. In sparsely populated areas, the cost-benefit ratio will always be low, which, but if, if your house is flooded, uh, that is no uh, comfort whatsoever. And if, if these uh, statistics are reeled out constantly by the environment agency or government, it can often sound callous and uncaring to those people whose homes have been flooded. Uh, the focus uh, on my short contribution, uh, Sir Roger, has been on industry, but, if I, and, but I and my colleagues have all had the rather miserable experience of having to visit uh, people whose homes have been flooded. And uh, it's not just the uh, impact, the immediate impact. The fact is that it is many, many months of misery, and many of the people who've been forced out of their homes in Barrow Haven and other areas such as South Ferriby and my honourable friend's uh, constituency will remain in uh, temporary accommodation into, into next year and perhaps even, be, even beyond. And it, it, it is quite simply not satisfactory. Yeah, Certainly. Point, uh, Mr. Chairman, you may like to know that some of the people affected in Hull in 2007 have only recently moved back into their houses. There was flooding and then secondary flooding, and I'm sure that will also apply to people on Hazel Foreshore in my constituency and uh, areas all around the patch. This will be a level of misery that is almost unimaginable. Martin Vickers. The right honourable uh, gentleman is absolutely correct, and uh, it, it's frightening to consider that uh, after six or seven years uh, that you know, people are still suffering in, in that way. As he also pointed out in his speech, floodwaters do not follow constituency boundaries. Um, we've um, been united uh, approach to this. The, uh, my right honourable friend spoke about the united approach given by the uh, local authorities. The Humber, uh, as uh, those of us who live locally know, uh, well know, can often uh, divide uh, the, uh, particularly the political communities. Uh, but on this occasion, we are absolutely uh, united. The government have. Uh, put together or are in the process of putting together uh, longer term plans. The figures uh, have uh, been quoted uh, during the course of the debate here, 800, between eight and 900 uh, million. I recognize uh, that uh, the uh, minister is not going to write us a check uh, later today, but we do, and, and as my honorable friend points out, that's a bit extremely disappointing, <laughs> but uh, 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 our constituents deserve nothing less than a serious plan put forward in the very near future that will re uh, guarantee them the security and safety they need in their homes. And if the industry of uh, northern Lincolnshire and the Humberside area is to go forward as we all want it to, they need the security, as, as again the uh, honourable uh, gentleman from uh, Hull Western Hessel pointed out, they need the security that... Uh, government is behind them and that the environment agency government and every agency involved will produce a plan that is long term and provides the security that is necessary. Yeah. Graham Stewart. Thank you Sir Roger and it's a pleasure to uh, serve under your chairmanship and follow excellent speeches from across the chamber uh, giving a very clear message to the minister and I know the rest of the front bench about the unity uh, of feeling around the Humber and as has been said but it's worth reiterating that is across uh, party lines, that is local authorities um, working together. It is under the, uh, the industrial leadership of the LEP. Uh, we are all united in this alongside the technical uh, uh, input and understanding of the Environment Agency and other agencies. We are united in this. I, Minister, I take uh, you back to uh, December and visiting a residence in Kilnsey in my constituency just above Spurn Point to meet the uh, chairman of the parish council there in his recently refurbished house seeing the devastation of him and his wife 
with their brand new kitchen, with the facilities recently put in, uh, wrecked by the overtopping of the nearby bank. And it's to his uh, credit that he wasn't primarily concerned with his own interests, but was in fact going out and took me to meet other residents whose homes had similarly been devastated, some of whom were less resilient uh, than that couple because of their age, um, infirmity, and the personal impact of flooding on people in homes, uh, as the Minister will know, is utterly devastating. And it comes uh, just a number of years after the 2007 floods. Last Wednesday, 25th of June, was the anniversary of those floods, which devastated Hull, devastated the East Riding, uh, led to the cutting off of Hauntsey in my constituency, led to flooding in every area of my constituency and in Hull with many people out of their homes, not just for months, but in some cases for years. Flooding is absolutely, personally devastating. And that will always be at the forefront of my mind when I look at this issue. But if I may, I would follow my honourable friend for Cleethorpe's uh, points around the opportunity. We have a fantastic and phenomenal positive opportunity around the Humber at the moment. And I pay tribute uh, to Lord Haskins, the chairman of the LEP, and uh, others who are working together to uh, take the area forward. We have uh, lower than average incomes in Yorkshire and Humber. And Yorkshire and the Humber has among the lowest average incomes in England. So we, we start from a position with great levels of deprivation, um, some history of uh, economic failure, relatively speaking, and yet a massive opportunity opening up now. And we're working on that cross-party and, again, across authority. Uh, this government should take enormous credit for the steps it's taken to help the halving of the Humber Bridge tolls, as men, instead of that bridge acting as a barrier between the two banks working together for the economic betterment of the whole, is now a catalyst as the, uh, the tolls have been halved. Uh, again, on a cross-party basis, we made representation to the Secretary of State for Transport. He is, uh, has agreed to the electrification of the line to Hull. That will make a significant difference. Of course, the Culture Secretary, uh, then Culture Secretary, announced that Hull had been uh, made the City of Culture 2017. That too is having a galvanizing effect. Um, from the Prime Minister down, working again uh, throughout government, uh, efforts were made to encourage uh, Siemens to sign up to come to Hull and for uh, the uh, supply chain to come into Paul in my constituency immediately to the east of Hull. That too was successful. Um, education standards. I was my great pleasure to lead the Education Select Committee to Hull last Monday and Tuesday to visit schools there, to see a real re sense of renewal and energy and drive to raise standards there. There is a massive opportunity for the area and it is waiting to be grasped. Now, if I look at clouds on the horizon, I see actually remarkably few. What, uh, what I do see is the pros prospect of a chilling impact of uh, a risk of flooding. If, if industries such as Smith and Nephew, which the Right Honourable Gentleman uh, for West Hull and Hessel mentioned, if they see that their investment is at risk from a failure to provide suitable protection, then they can so easily take that investment elsewhere. And that is true of so many of the companies which such efforts are being put into at the moment to attract um, and reinforce their presence in the Humber area. But we have that enormous opportunity and we cannot afford to have it chilled by a failure to take the long-term view of the need for flood protection. The government rightly recognises the challenges of climate change, and anyone involved with that will know that the risks around climate change are twofold, uh, or in two areas. One is the need to mitigate, and the other is to adapt. It is not enough simply to mitigate, you also need to adapt. And I have in front of me the excellent uh, science, latest science briefing from the uh, uh, Royal Society and the National Academy of Sciences in the United States, which shows the uh, sea level rise record since the beginning of the 20th century, and it shows the acceleration of sea level rise which has occurred in the last few decades, which is expected to carry on accelerating up to the end of this century. How then can we allow the short-term political time frames in which we operate, four or five years to a general election between local government elections, how can we allow that to inform our attitude to this subject? And the danger is that we will, and that we will not take the long-term view which is so important if we're to get this right. So my message to the Minister is to look at how government can create the frameworks to ensure that 
the resource that is required comes uh, is invested in time on time for a long-term threat because we recognize the dynamics of the politics in which we operate on a daily basis are not very good at dealing with long-term threats and therefore we need to look hard at how we get a framework in place to make sure that that is incentivized and does happen because although uh, we will strongly make the case today as we are doing uh, for the Humber area the truth is nationally we need to take the risk of uh, flood damage more seriously uh, as we go forward. It fits entirely with the analysis the government itself makes of the risks around climate change and rising sea levels, and yet we don't see a coordinated, well thought through, long term plan to ensure that uh, uh, the correct protections are put in place. Um, I would just like to make, sh make sure the Minister is aware that. Uh, uh, separately to the Humber efforts, the River Hull Advisory Board is uh, studying the factors that contribute to flooding in the River Hull Valley, and that will have a strategic impact on the Humber as well. So across the piece, uh, we are all working as hard as we can to make sure that we have a joined-up approach. One of the criticisms of the 2008 uh, strategy was that it, perhaps because of its funding and the uh, brief it was given, failed to understand the interconnectedness of uh, both city and rural area, the way that uh, rural areas often act as a sponge for the urban areas, and that you can't view um, areas of the Humber, as uh, I think my right honourable friend said in his opening speech, you can't view them in isolation. There is no way of ring-fencing them, of just having a limited uh, spend here and somehow you can protect that. You have to view the whole as one joined-up uh, issue. Um, if I may return to the issue of Kilnsey a moment, the uh, replacement of the bank, which was overtopped in December, will cost £450,000 uh, to implement. Uh, the Environment Agency have uh, uh, given 300000 promised 300000 and 50000 has been raised locally. But that leaves the project £100,000 short. And the bank is important to defend the residential and business properties of the village, such as that uh, fine purveyor of Great Ales, the Crown and Anchor pub, uh, and it also plays a vital role in defending the road to Spurn Point, uh, which is a popular tourist destination of national uh, significance. Uh, Spurn Point itself plays a phenomenally important role in, uh, in protecting uh, the, uh, the, the, the Hull Ports area. Uh, it provides a natural barrier deflecting the longshore drift away from the estuary and thus allows the estuary to self-clean to an extent. Um, I must pay tribute to the internal drainage boards who do such an excellent job of maintaining inland watercourses, yet uh, a point to make which I hope, if he hasn't done so already, the Minister might take up with the Marine Management Organisation is the fact that that new fresh quango uh, no sooner came into being than it slapped a £10,000 bill on uh, the IDB for carrying out work which if the Environment Agency had carried out the same work with the same contractors would have attracted no such um, uh, bill and that was it represented more than 10% of the project cost and if we're going to have uh, uh, local areas taking responsibility investing money making things happen we need to make sure that large quangos don't come along giving 3,000 pound initial estimates which I think is outrageous but then in the end uh, charge 10,000 pounds which truly is outrageous one final uh, local point for me is to mention the Wellick realignment scheme that scheme is ongoing but delays are causing increased flood risk um, as the bank needs to be restored, but investment is being held back uh, until the overall realignment scheme is confirmed. Decisions need to be made more quickly and action taken so that we have ongoing, sustained, sensible protection which can protect uh, both industry and residential properties from the risk of flood. Uh, Minister, we will be maintaining our joint efforts in this regard, not only when we meet the Prime Minister next week, but thereafter, uh, I'll finish as I touched on earlier, around the issue of trying to get a framework in place that means that it doesn't just require the united effort of MPs in an area to get people to see the long-term risk which, for which the technical evidence is already present. We need a strategic uh, overview by government of the risks around flood with rising sea levels and the risks of climate change. And without it, we are uh, putting at risk our constituents of the devastation of flooding in the homes. We're also risking investment and commercial success for this country as well. So it's with that plea that I sit down. Thank you, Sir Roger. Order.
Um, I intend to try to call the front benches at about 10.35, two members waiting to speak. I'd be grateful if you'd bear that in mind. Diana Johnson. Thank you, Sir Roger, for calling me to speak. I wasn't intending to contribute to this debate because I think uh, the uh, contributions we've heard already have been uh, of a very high standard, have set the case very well, and I hope the Minister will respond to the points that have been raised. But I did just want to highlight one particular issue which I think ha has a knock-on effect from uh, the investment that needs to go into the Humber area, and that is around flood insurance. And the Minister and I have had very long debates about this issue in the past, but I just wanted to raise that how important it is to make sure for the insurance industry to know that there is the investment going into the Humber area, which will then mean that both for, for domestic, residential, and also for business properties, there's access to affordable flood insurance. And I know the government have introduced uh, the flood re-scheme, which I think comes into operation quite soon for properties built before 2010. But there is an issue, and I've raised this with the Minister before, about properties built after 2010. And in my own constituency, there's a large development called Kingswood. Pe uh, houses are being built now. And the Minister may also uh, like to know that it's one of the most successful help-to-buy schemes in the country operating on that estate. But those properties will not be covered by the flood re-scheme. So those uh, owner-occupiers will be looking to the open market to get uh, flood insurance in the future. And schemes like this to protect the Humber area are really important in making sure that they will be able to access uh, affordable flood insurance. And the other point I just wanted to raise was about businesses. Businesses will not be covered by the flood re-scheme. So again, they're out <coughs> there in the open market looking for flood insurance. And I'm very well aware in my uh, Right Honourable Friends constituency in Hull Western Hessel, there's one business that already has seen a hike of 490% in their flood uh, premiums, in their insurance premiums, because of the flooding that happened last December. So I would urge the Minister to think again about the uh, problems that happen in the insurance market if the government uh, does not make the right noises about providing investment over the coming years for the Humber uh, region and how devastating it is, particularly to homeowners when their homes are flooded and if they haven't got flood insurance, how much worse it is. So I just wanted to make those points uh, this morning. Thank you. Andrew Percy. Uh, thank you, uh, Sir Roger. It's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Lady whose uh, issues on flood insurance are well rehearsed and one which I uh, supported her at during the proceedings on the uh, uh, water bill as they uh, went through uh, the committee stage uh, here. I want to uh, begin by uh, congratulating my right honourable friend on securing this debate and um, uh, coming on last unfortunately it does mean I will be repeating not only what the right honourable gentleman said but what many other honourable and right honourable members says but as I said already but as we've got uh, 10 or 11 minutes until the front benches need to be called. I am um, sure you will indulge me, uh, Sir Roger, uh, in that endeavour. Um, it is, um, uh, the Minister uh, sadly is going to have heard, uh, or going to hear again lots of what I've already said, not least because at the point of the uh, tidal surge we were going through the proceedings on the water bill of which I was on the committee, so I used that opportunity on more than one occasion to regale the Minister with what was happening in our area, but just for um, uh, the record, it, I want to just uh, talk about my own constituency with specific reference to what happened in December. Mine was the uh, most uh, hit constituency and as any uh, uh, flood extent map will show you, remains the constituency in terms of uh, land that is most at risk of flooding. And in uh, December, uh, unfortunately, we were hit on three, um, uh, from three uh, uh, sources. Uh, the Humber coming over at South Ferriby and at Wintringham and at Burton. Uh, sorry, at Burton on Stather, we had the Trent coming over. We had the Trent coming over at Burringham. We had the Trent coming over at Kidby. We had the Trent coming over at Amcots. And then we had the Ouse coming over at uh, Reedness. So we had, uh, in total, about 11 communities uh, that were flooded, resulting in about uh, three or 400 um, uh, properties being flooded. And as other uh, members have said uh, today, Sir Roger, we were very lucky, actually, although we don't feel particularly lucky, that it wasn't a lot greater. I was stood on the banks of, I live right by the River Air, right on the bank of the River Air. I was stood on that river at the point of the surge um, that evening, and it was within inches of coming over there where we enjoy very high levels of protection. The highest environment agency 
um, offers. And indeed, the next morning I was stood on the banks for the high tide the next morning of the River Ouse at Gould, um, which uh, also had a near miss uh, where there are, of course, uh, 18,000 residents. Uh, and had that happened, and had we, uh, for the circumstances come together as other honourable and right honourable gentlemen uh, uh, s uh, said we were, stated we were very... Uh, lucky to avoid, then we would have uh, uh, been devastated in our area. This is unfortunately, Sir Roger, not new uh, to our area or in particular to my constituency. We had flooding in Gould in 2011, in 2012 and in 2007 and in 2008. We had flooding in Kroll in 2012 and this is a, a recurring theme which seems to uh, affect our area, not least because of the geography and the flood extent risk maps um, explain uh, why and the uh, right honourable gentleman of course, uh, for Hot Price and Haven gave a potted history of the draining uh, uh, undertaken by uh, Vermoyden in our area. Um, that was hundreds of years ago. Um, uh, people have been living uh, happily uh, in our area since then. And it is a concern to people, uh, as the Honourable Member for Beverly said, that uh, previous uh, regimes and previous uh, flood plans seem to operate on the premise that the rural areas can operate as a sponge. Uh, or, or, or be sacrificed um, to the benefit of uh, other areas. And I want to explain why that's particularly dangerous in my constituency. We were faced in 2007 with the uh, first draft of the River Trent Flood Catchment Management Plan, which had it not been for the uh, uh, IDBs and uh, several um, well-educated uh, farmers in the issue of flooding, that could well have been the policy that was adopted by um, the Environment Agency at that time, only by the arguing, and we got petitions up and all the rest of it uh, uh, around that, the Environment Agency were made to think again and to go and reassess this. And they'd actually concluded that had they indeed adopted the policy they wanted to adopt, which was one of withdrawal, retreat and sacrifice, then actually the entirety of the Isle of Axum, apart from two high spots at Epworth, um, would have been underwater within a decade or two. Um, so it's quite... F I will give way to the right on gentlemen. I'm grateful to my honourable friend for giving way. If the government of the day, as a matter of policy, decides that it is all right to allow agricultural land to be flooded, is there not an argument to say, in that case, farmers should be paid for storing water just as they are paid for growing crops? <laughs> yes. uh, Andrew Percy. An interesting idea. I think we'd all prefer it, actually, if farmers were allowed to go on uh, and continue producing food but uh, absolutely he does raise one of the biggest criticisms of the current funding regime is the value that's placed on agricultural land uh, is not sufficient uh, and I, I'm not against uh, flood alleviation uh, projects of course not that in include the sacrificing of land we had uh, Orkborough Flats in my constituency which operated very well and possibly lowered levels uh, on the uh, Trent uh, to such an extent that it prevented a couple of communities from flooding. Um, so those, uh, we're, we don't have an issue with, um, with, with some uh, of these schemes in appropriate areas. What we have a problem with is the value placed on agricultural land generally and on rural communities under the current system and what seemed to be in the original drafts of the various flood catchment plans for our area, uh, a, a, a retreat and sacrifice of rural areas. Now, that has abated somewhat um, through the various uh, processes um, uh, for which we are very uh, grateful. Uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman for Hunt Price and Howden and others have uh, highlighted the uh, uh, and the right honourable gentleman for Hull West and Hesel did also uh, highlight on the uh, national infrastructure uh, in our area and the uh, national risk register. Uh, in my own constituency, to add to the list of nationally important infrastructure, which we all seem to be trotting out today, um, I, of course, have the port of Goul, which is England's uh, busiest and biggest inland port. Uh, we've got the power stations at Kidby, which are uh, Kidby, of course, was one of the communities that uh, flooded uh, in <coughs> December. Uh, Jack's power station just across the way and of course the biomass imports come <coughs> through uh, my constituency via the uh, railway lines. Petrochemicals, my honourable friend for Cleethorpes has talked about um, uh, uh, and of course we have the motorway and rail uh, infrastructure, agricultural land, uh, some of the I think is it uh, 55 to 60 percent of our land is grade uh, A uh, uh, agricultural land, um, so some of the most productive land uh, in the country. Um, and of course, actually, when we talk about the Isle of Axum, it doesn't just protect the defences along the Trent there and along the Ouse don't just protect um, uh, the homes on the Isle of Axum, which unfortunately, it is 50,000 acres and 20,000 uh, residents, 
But actually, those defences are major defences for Doncaster and for Thorne, uh, and uh, a catastrophic breach of those defences would have significant impacts uh, on Doncaster. And unfortunately, when it comes to the funding, that's not always necessarily accounted for, although it is taken into account. Uh, and of course, we have... Uh, I will give right on. Right on um, can I draw his attention to one other thing which has not been mentioned so far? Uh, and that is the, even where there is a scoring for residential accommodation, uh, which is the highest in, in this ranking, uh, of course it's scored on the basis of value. And one of the things that works against the north of England generally is that properties tend to be lower value. And therefore you have a cyclical effect that because the house is cheaper, it gets less defence and therefore it gets cheaper. It feeds on its own poverty. Does he agree with me that this is actually a rather distorting impact on the funding for defences? Uh, absolutely, uh, Sir Roger, and that one of the uh, things I want to go on and talk about are the current problems and failings in the uh, current system. But before I do, I do want to just, uh, uh, so we don't sound to be entirely negative, actually, praise the government. The response we actually had in our area post the uh, surge in December was actually uh, very welcome. We've uh, appreciated the uh, food and uh, renewal grants, the support for business has been uh, well received uh, and also actually the additional funding that has gone in um, uh, from the government since December has been particularly beneficial to my area. We've had a £5 million scheme to raise the banks at Reedness approved, £3 million to shore up the banks at Snaith approved and in a couple of weeks, uh, well actually in a month's time, work will begin uh, in uh, Burringham uh, uh, on the banks there to, to uh, shore up the banks there which of course um, didn't breach but were uh, severely damaged. I give way to my friend from Stumpo. Uh, for Holton, Price and Hound and for its leadership on this matter to which hopefully the whole region will benefit. Um, my honourable friend makes the point about response and I think the local agencies all responded very well uh, and I, uh, but in terms of learning from this I would draw attention to the Humberside Fire and Rescue Services plans to try and develop a flood preparation and response arc centre, uh, cent training centre which I think will be a, a major benefit not only to this region but nationally as well. What does my honourable friend think about that? I, I, thank, uh, I thank my honourable uh, friend for reminding me about that excellent bid which is into the transition fund uh, DCLG um, uh, for determination I think towards the end of this year. Um, the honourable gentleman and my honourable friend met with the um, uh, fire and rescue service uh, recently to discuss this bid. This is a bid that will create a national uh, flood training centre. There isn't one at the moment. Uh, presently, they have to go and do their training in fresh water. Uh, some of that fresh water is not always as clean as it could be. Uh, and one of the problems we have at the moment, unfortunately, is you can't model events through it. Um, but more importantly, uh, many firefighters come back with stomach bugs, which actually makes it very expensive. So there is this bid in to create a proper um, uh, flood training centre which uh, can model uh, particular events. Where better could you place that than in the Humber, which is, uh, as we know, after London, the highest flood risk area. Uh, and, of course, I know the support for that bid um, from across both sides of the uh, Humber and across uh, MPs of both parties. So we look forward to that. And anything the Minister can do to push that along with his friends at DCLG would be greatly uh, appreciated. Um, so uh, I am conscious of time. Uh, I, uh, as I've said to the Minister, do praise the government for acting swiftly uh, in terms of the surveying work that's uh, been undertaken uh, and some of this additional funding which is going to benefit my constituents in the short term. That is welcome, but it's still only a short-term fix. And I think the basis of our debate here today is to, um, whilst, I, whilst being grateful for any short-term additional funding that comes in, is to set out this long-term strategy which we uh, desperately require for all of the reasons that have been uh, espoused today. I do think our uh, uh, region is on the, or the Humber, East Yorkshire and Northern Lincolnshire, is on the uh, edge of a, uh, an economic renewal. We have the uh, Siemens investment which has been talked about and we've got the potential ABLE UK site. So there's a lot happening and this must be the greatest risk um, to our uh, economic renewal. Uh, is this, uh, it would be a failure to proper, um, properly uh, and adequately deal with uh, this massive flood risk that we have. So £880 million pounds does sound, £888 million pounds does sound a lot of money, but over a decade, a decade and a half, it is not that significant. The return and the value of return which has been expressed today uh, um, uh, tells you all you need to know about the value of that. Uh, I don't have time to go on about uh, some of the um, 
to problems with the current uh, funding uh, system, such as building in future developments, such as the values on uh, agricultural land, etc., etc. The minister has heard those uh, many times uh, before. Um, I just uh, uh, urge the minister, uh, as he has, and he's been uh, very uh, gracious in all of our debates we've had, and very um, uh, knowledgeable about the flooding that uh, hit our area, um, to do all he can to support uh, our proposal for a long-term uh, solution. Uh, to our problems. We're not uh, expecting him, although I did shout it was outrageous that he's not going to write us a cheque for £888 million pounds, uh, today. It's not actually all that outrageous. Um, uh, we, uh, we, we're, tomorrow we'll do it, my own little friend, please puts in. Um, uh, uh, we simply need to build the support within DEFRA and across government um, uh, for this long-term solution to what is a very unique problem. Uh, the Humber is unique. I know everybody claims their area is uh, unique, um, but we really are, um, for all of the reasons that have been expressed today, and also because of the massive flood risk and risk to infrastructure, the national risk and all the rest of it. Um, so I uh, end by, once again, congratulating my right hon. Friend, Tom Paisan, for securing this debate. But we will go forward uh, from this debate uh, as a group uh, united to meet the Prime Minister next week, uh, and uh, that won't be the end of it either. Uh, we will continue to... Uh, push this to ensure that not only the businesses uh, get the investment that are required to make them come and create jobs, but more importantly, that the people we represent uh, in their homes are better protected into the future. Barry Gardner. Sir Roger, um, it's been quite extraordinary debate in many ways. Um, we, we've had some very eminent members of this House uh, stand up, but uh, also um, it, the, the, the cross party good nature of the debate. Um, I never thought I would live to, to see the day when certain members were calling each other friends uh, across the House, but uh, someone perhaps more risk averse than I might have referred this, to this as the Yorkshire Mafia, um, but I think they have, uh, so I wouldn't dream of doing such a thing, um, but they've certainly made a very powerful case today, uh, and I'm sure the Minister will take note of it, and I'm, I'm sure that the Prime Minister will take note of it. When, when he meets them next week. Um, I do want to pay tribute to uh, the Right Honourable Member for Holton Price and Howden, um, particularly because this is not something that he has simply taken up in this debate. His parliamentary questions, his previous interventions have all focused very clearly and, and repeatedly uh, on moving the debate on flood risk away simply from rhetoric and onto some very simple facts. And, and, and he's been absolutely right to do so. Uh, and I think in, in this debate, um, he, he set it off in exactly the right term. Um, the facts that he's previously uh, alluded to and which I wish to, to pick up on now are the government's capital spending plans up to 2020, 2021, um, which will result in a significant increase in the number of properties at risk of flooding, uh, uh, partly in the way that he's outlined already today. Uh, the flood risk is increasing because of climate change, as he said, and the government's maintenance spending plans on tidal defences will result in a deterioration of existing flood assets. These are serious issues, uh, and it's absolutely right that they've been debated so thoroughly this morning. I want to focus primarily uh, on the first two points, um, increased flood risk and capital investment. The government has set out its forward projections for capital investment in flood defences. They say that they will spend £370 million a year in 2015-16 and in every year through to 2021. Um, but the question arises as to what percentage of that money will be for new build flood defences and what will be for major capital repairs and maintenance. Now, the truth is that we don't know. The government has chosen to use capital spend as a proxy for spending on new flood defences in what it has said. As a result, many people think that, uh, will think that they are building more defences and defending more properties when in fact, because of climate change and storm damage, they will simply be spending more on major repairs to existing defences. In other words, there may be no increase in the number of defences or indeed the number of properties and homes that are defended by them. The Committee on Climate Change has analysed the figure of 165,000 properties that the Secretary of State has said will be better protected uh, in the current spending period. This is when he gave evidence to the Environment Select Committee. Um, they warned that only a proportion of this 165,000 will actually see their flood risk reduced. 
many capital schemes are simply replacing or refurbishing existing defences on a like-for-like -like basis to the same crest height. That is not good enough for all the reasons that honourable members have outlined this morning. With climate change, many of these houses will actually be less well protected than when the defences were originally built. The defence may have been repaired, but the risk that it will be overtopped as a result of changing climate has now increased. So far too many homes and properties are still at risk because the defences we do have are less effective than they once were because of the increased frequency and severity of extreme weather. This is one of the reasons why the UK Statistics Authority is still not satisfied with the government's flood spending statistics. The UK Statistics Authority has yet to get to a point where it can be satisfied that the government is telling, as it says, the truth about flood defence spending. Needless to say, this makes the job of planning for everyone involved in flood risk management incredibly difficult. The government's failure to provide a straight answer to the question of how it plans to reduce flood risk has made effective scrutiny of their policy very difficult. The Right Honourable Member for Holton Price and Howden has called for the government to be more strategic in its interventions and to stop being, uh, and I quote him, uh, penny wise and pound foolish, not from this morning but from pre his previous statements. Um, he's exactly right. The Humber Flood Risk Management Strategy produced in 2008 seemed to strike the right balance on the basis of the best available evidence at that time. But what we must be clear about is that uh, the evidence on flood risk has changed. It's changed rapidly and significantly over the past six years. An important example here is that the 2008 strategy states that of the 33 flood management areas in the, uh, in the Humber plan, the Environment Agency considered it would be necessary to withdraw from 11. There were 1,961 homes in these 11 areas in 2008. Uh, and it's, I think, significant that in opening his remarks, the Right Honourable Member already said that he was told by government that the 2008 numbers in his constituency have increased by more than a thousand already. Um, since 2008, our understanding of how flood risk is changing has increased significantly. The Met Office have stated that what was a 1 in 125 extreme rainfall event is to be considered as a 1 in 85 event, and that trend is expected to continue. It's also chastening to consider that sea levels in England are rising by about six millimetres per year. The evidence is clear that the risk to the people of the Humber has increased. The simple message is that since 2010, whilst the assessment of the risks have continued to rise, the government has chosen to cut investment in flood defences. We need to run just to hold flood risk at current levels. The Humber risk assessment must now reflect all the new evidence on flood risk and the backlog of work that has not been delivered because of the cuts. The EA carried out an updated Humber flood risk management strategy in 2011 that makes it clear that more new defences will be needed, more improvement of existing defences will be needed, more managed realignment of the coast as well as increased flood storage will be essential. And my right honourable friend for Hull West and Hessel uh, has quantified that rightly at 880 million pounds over the next 10 years. But the minister must be clear about who exactly he expects to deliver the strategic approach to flood risk reduction required in the Humber. Since 2010, the number of environment agency staff working to fulfill the statutory consultation role on flood risk has reduced by 40%. The government has also made adapting to future flood risk voluntary for all local authorities. This is not the coordinated, well thought through, long term plan that the member for Beverly spoke of, um, who I now trust is the toast of the Crown and Anchor pub, whom he referred to so liberally. Um, the government has decided not to implement sustainable urban drainage, which would have required developers and water companies to meet some of the cost. No wonder the Right Honourable Member for Holton Price and Howden has called for the government to be more strategic. The outgoing head of the Environment Agency. Um, I'm conscious that the minister needs to get in, so if you'll forgive me. Um, the outgoing head of the Environment Agency used a speech at the RSA last week to call for a cross-party consensus, such as we've seen this morning. That is what we had with the pit review, an approach that focused on building the capacity for strategic intervention. 92 recommendations, only 46 of which have now been implemented. 
And this approach saw improvements implemented at Bruff, at Swinefleet, at Birmingham, at Gunners, at Stallingborough, and Halton Marshes. But since 2010, many of the projects named in the Humber Flood Risk Management Strategy are now stuck in the pipeline as the government cuts have closed off and in some cases indefinitely delayed the available funding for essential projects. Examples include Sutton, Sutton Ings Flood Alleviation Scheme, Sustainable Drainage Retrofit, which would have protected an area of Central Hull with 2,982 homes currently at significant flood risk. Ulsby Flood, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Ulf, Ulfby, um, Flood Alleviation Scheme, which would have protected an area of Grimsby with 2,164 homes currently at significant risk of flooding. We urgently need to get back to an evidence-based flood management policy that all sides of this house can support. Nothing else will deliver the risk management strategy that is required for the Humber. Uh, thank you, Sir Roger. It's a pleasure to serve under your uh, chairmanship. And I should start, um, as is the convention, but I should to say in a, in a very heartfelt way to thank the right honourable gentleman for uh, securing this debate, which has given honourable members across uh, the region, across parties, the opportunity to add their voices to uh, a collective uh, strategy um, at the political level, working with the technical expertise and the communities that are involved to um, move forward on addressing flood risk in the area. As he set out, and as others have uh, reminded us, Sir Roger, on the 5th of December 2013, the East Coast experienced a very serious tidal surge, causing flooding to communities along the banks of the Humber and indeed upstream. And the defences were overtopped, flooding over 1,100 homes and businesses and 700 hectares of land around the Humber. And a number of honourable and right honourable members have talked about um, the importance of some of that land as well. I and the government very much appreciate the impact that this has had and the distress which is caused to the communities and businesses uh, which are affected. I sympathise deeply with those whose homes and businesses were flooded. I've seen firsthand, of course, the effects of flooding around uh, the country and on Wednesday, one of the key thoughts referred to the fact that a, a number of um, uh, ministers have uh, visited his constituency in the surrounding area um, uh, to look at those impacts. I'm very grateful too to the Environment Agency and all the other risk management authorities in the area and indeed the emergency responders as well for the excellent work uh, that they do in preparing for, which is important, and managing events such as this one, without which the damage would clearly have been much, much worse. Yes. When the flooding happened, they responded quickly and efficiently and therefore I need to thank them again as I've done in previous debates, all those professionals uh, and volunteers for the way in which they responded to the exceptional weather. 12,000 warnings were sent directly to homes and businesses, allowing people to prepare. And we should not forget that our defences protected 156,000 properties in the area during the surge. Now, the Honourable Member for Cleethorpes I think, was, was, was setting out that it's, um, it's difficult for people who've been flooded to hear a government talking about what has been achieved. But I think, um, as the Honourable Lady, the Member for Hull North, pointed out, it is important to send the message to uh, those looking at investing and those who uh, take decisions about uh, levels of insurance premium and excesses and so on, that actually defences do protect communities and that, 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 that many of those operated successfully in this instance as in others. This was an event, as we've heard Sir Roger, of a similar magnitude, though slightly greater to that disastrous surge of 1953 in which 24,000 properties flooded and more than 300 people lost their lives. Surges like the one which we saw in 1953 uh, and December of last year will occur again, and it's possible that climate change could make such events more common and more severe. We cannot stop those events from happening, but we can ensure that our planning, our preparation, and our investment in defences protects communities when the events happen, and this is an ongoing process which honourable and right honourable members here are very much at the heart of for their communities. Will I will indeed give way. Well, I'll not be able to do that very often because no. I want to get through all the issues. I'm grateful to the Minister. On the, on the point about putting a strategic framework in place, I wonder if you could reflect on that, whether we need to establish, a, as they have in Holland, flood protection standards, which then trigger the resource in order to deliver the standard, rather than having a certain amount of resource and doing the best you can with that. Well, 
I'll, I'll come on to the issue of, of, of resourcing in a minute, if I may, uh, Sir Roger, but uh, the Honourable Gentleman makes a, a point about approach in another um, jurisdiction. A number of people referred to uh, Holland during the course of the debate, or well, the Netherlands, I should, as I should properly uh, uh, say. Um, one example of uh, that investment, that ongoing process to which I was referring, is the £20 million defence improvement, uh, the project under construction to provide better protection in Grimsby, which will be completed in autumn 2015. I'll say a little more about what's being done in the Humber area in, the moment, in, in a moment, but first let me put this in the national context, uh, following on from the, the comments of the, the um, Honourable Member for Brent North. Um, one of the, uh, uh, I've, I've sort of worked with him in select committee and now facing across the chamber in our debates, he's one of the two um, uh, opposition front members that his party leader has thoughtfully provided to uh, shadow me, and I'm obviously very grateful for to, to both of them for the, the way in which they do that. Um, I will... Um, uh, uh, reiterate that flood management is a government priority. We're spending £3.2 billion pounds on flood and coastal erosion management over this Parliament. And for the future, we have made a record level six-year capital commitment of at least £370 million pounds per year, as the Honourable Gentleman said, rising to over £400 million in 2020-21 on improving defences. We'll be publishing uh, uh, what's called a pipeline, I use jargon terms, but a pipeline for flood defence improvement projects for the next six years with the 2014 autumn statement. And this will provide protection for at least a further 300,000 households throughout the country, meaning that by the end of the decade, we will have protected, provided a better level of protection to at least 465,000 households, together with our achievements over the period of this parliament. Despite taking a terrible battering over this winter, our defences have protected a significant amount of properties. Around 1.3 million properties and more than 950 square miles of farmland were protected during this period. In response to the exceptional events of the winter, the government acted quickly, and not only did we make an extra £270 million available to repair, restore and maintain critical defences, we also made available recovery money for those most seriously affected. The £270 million of additional funding is being used on the ground now to help the Environment Agency and other risk management authorities to ensure that important defences are repaired before the coming winter and return to target condition as soon as possible. So we have heard from time to time the sort of implication that some of these defences will not uh, be there to do the job for which they were originally designed. And that's why it's crucially important that that money is spent and is being spent to make sure that they, the uh, defences are back up to that target condition. Coming on specifically to the Humber Flood Risk Management Strategy, the Government at the time approved the Humber Flood Risk Management Strategy in 2007, providing the Environment Agency a strategic business case to invest up to £323 million over a 25-year period to 2032 uh, on works to manage and reduce tidal flood risk in the area. Although the strategy was led by the Environment Agency, I understand that it was developed with and supported by other risk management authorities and key stakeholders in the area. The first programme of improvement schemes started to be delivered in 2009, including schemes at Brough, Swinefleet, Holton Marshes, Starlingborough and Donanook, and schemes have since been delivered at Burringham, Gunnis, uh, Tetney, Grimsby and Cleethorpes, which is under construction. Defence improvements are being planned for Hull. Um, the right honourable member for um, Hull Western has all set out the importance of the protection at the Albert Dock. The uh, temporary defences are there, so they're, they're in place uh, to raise that level of defence. And the work which he was um, concerned about, which will make that permanent, will be completed during this financial year. Um, and even if they aren't made permanent uh, uh, by this winter, of course, those temporary defences are in place to do, to do that job, and they will be made permanent. But I think it's important that he raised that, given the uh, level of risk there. I wanted to pick up on a, uh, a few points in the time remaining, if I may. Uh, Sir Roger. Uh, can, I, can I just come respond to the points I already have? I apologise, <laughs> gentlemen, but there's, there's a great deal to get through. Um, the uh, honourable, right honourable member for Hogforest and Howden in his uh, initial remarks raised the importance of new defences, but also the importance of assessing uh, and uh, looking at the existing defences to see where improvements need to be made, and that very much has to be part of the strategy. Quite right to, to point that out, and I think that's an example there in, in Hull of, of that process uh, being carried out. He raised the issue of the entire uh, catchment, if you like, the entire estuary and the effects there. I, I think, I mean, it is possible to ring fence some of the, the major centres of population. And other right honourable and honourable members have, uh, or honourable members certainly, have referred to um, at the times when farmland can be used and as a short term measure to um, absorb water. And while I accept the uh, point that the, uh, my right honourable friend, the member for East Yorkshire, made about the importance of farmland in terms of the local economy and the need to protect food security for the country. 
There are schemes around, and there's one in, in Kent, where farmers have been paid to take uh, flood water as part of a strategy in a local area. And where a case can be made for doing that, then that's certainly something uh, that can be part of the solution. We've also put in place um, farm, uh, uh, the flood recovery funds for farmers so that they can apply um, uh, to restore land which is affected. I know that a number of uh, farmers in the West Country have done that, but that money has also been available for people in, uh, who were affected by the early December flooding in the, the region that we're talking about. And uh, uh, it, I think it's important to get on the record that that, that, that was available there to, to help people deal with those shorter term uh, effects. I am um, also very grateful to our talking gentlemen, and indeed other uh, honourable and right honourable members, for their recognition that uh, I, I, I do not have the chequebook with me to uh, sign up to uh, up to a billion pounds of investment here you today. But um, uh, while accepting that honourable members uh, are, are very disappointed to hear that, I um, think it's really important that the work that they're doing, along with the technical advice that's being received and the work that all the local authorities are involved in, uh, will make a very strong case for a, uh, a long-term uh, investment plan for securing this, which of course the government is then able to consider uh, with the most up-to-date information. Uh, I referred to um, the old doctor, the right honourable gentleman, um, but he set out once again uh, events which happened during the period of his government, which were of, of huge concern and had great impacts in Hull in, in particular, but also surrounding constituencies. And so we must always be aware of severity and likelihood of those impacts. Um, in terms of flood risk on smaller rural communities, one, one of the strengths of the government's partnership approach is that it has allowed some of these smaller schemes in rural areas to go ahead because uh, uh, we think up to 25% more schemes will go ahead because of the partnership funding approach. It has uh, given the opportunity for money to be raised locally to partner up with that investment and where some of these more rural schemes, as the Honourable Gentleman pointed out, would not necessarily have been uh, scored as highly as, as some of the, the, the bigger schemes. Partnership funding means they are taking place and uh, you know, I'm aware of m many rural schemes that, that are going ahead uh, because of that. Um, you raised the issue also of, of hypothecation of the, the climate uh, change levy and that being used. Um, clearly it's a matter for Her Majesty's Treasury as to how uh, 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 the uh, taxes which are received are spent. Uh, the position of, of successive governments has not been one to focus on hypothecation but to look at investing in things which are necessary. But as right honourable honourable gentlemen and, and uh, right honourable honourable members have done today, uh, we hear the case very loudly for that investment in flood defences, which is why we're, we're spending more than previous governments um, have done. Uh, the, right for, uh, sorry, the Honourable Member for Cleethorpe set out, as he has done consistently since the event, uh, the impacts on the local economy and the importance of uh, the port um, that he represents and so on. I think that's why it's crucial that all government departments and agencies are involved in these plans and strategies as we move forward so that colleagues at the Department for Transport, he has the advantage of the, the flood envoy covering the area, being a minister in that department, that we take account of what um, other departments can do to secure those critical uh, assets and, and, and infrastructure. And he also raised, again, the point about local knowledge, what in the um, local land managers and farmers internal uh, um, drainage boards are able to offer. And absolutely, the agency is very keen to work with them to take account of that and to make sure that they constantly improve uh, uh, what's there. But of course, many of the people who work for the Environment Agency also live in those areas and have worked in those areas for many, many years. So there is that great expertise within the agency for uh, looking at local areas too. Um, the Honourable um, Member for Beverly and Holderness talked uh, very movingly about the personal impacts and about the way some of those responders, parish council chairman in that case, were able to take action on behalf of the community even though they themselves were, were experiencing it. So I think it's very important to recognise that once again. He talked about climate change and the national picture. And uh, I think it is important to say, while clearly uh, uh, the, the members gathered here, uh, Sir Roger, will want to focus on what they want for their area, it's important that we make sure that the adequate, uh, uh, that the funding that we have available is, is, is there for everybody to make the case for it, because there are many areas around the, further down the east coast, for example, uh, and other parts of uh, the country which are vulnerable as well, who will be uh, looking to take forward schemes in their area. He, um, uh, my Honourable Friend Member for Beverly and Holness raised uh, a number of very uh, local schemes and impacts and repairs that are underway, and I'd be happy to write to him on some of those to make sure that we maintain progress on that. The Honourable Lady for Hull North um, raised, as she quite rightly pointed out, as she has done consistently, the importance of 
um, making sure that there is room for development in areas which are prone to flood risk. I think what we ha want to send a very strong message, though, as the government, as local authorities do too, that we want to make those areas resilient and as well protected as possible because what we don't want to do is just add to, to flood risk. The flood risk scheme builds on uh, uh, the what, what was there before, which, of course, was set up to properties that were built in 2008. So 2009 remains... Uh, the cutoff, but what we, we do is invest in flood defences to protect those areas, and that's why it's important that we're talking about what we're talking about today to protect uh, the uh, newer areas uh, as well. Um, so, Roger, the um, debate this, uh, this morning has given local members the opportunity to show that they are working together, that they are uh, working with their local communities, their local authorities, and using the expertise of the agency to bring forward a case for investment in their area. I'm uh, delighted that they've secured uh, a meeting with my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, to take that forward too, and um, that there is the opportunity to work with other government departments for where they're looking at community resilience 